My Lords, thank you. I was um, at page 292 of the external pagination of the authorities bundle in chapter 7 of McGarry and Wade, and in particular at paragraph 7.084, where the learned editors of McGarry deal with the special question of adverse possession of registered land. Now, in the, in the pages that follow, um, there is a uh, relatively compendious analysis of the legal position. And of course, I don't propose to take your lordships through through that um, in, in any in any way. Uh, suffice it to say, it is a as I've said before, um, a self-contained and entirely new legal apparatus contained within chat within Schedule Six, with the one exception of paragraph of Section Ninety Eight, which was the subject of debate, uh, or at least questioning of myself, before the short adjournment. And I think I've already adverted to the fact that the, the Schedule 6 apparatus essentially works as follows, and, and it's within your Lordship's bundle, the, the, um, the relevant provisions, of course, that a uh, an applicant who's been in adverse possession, so-called, that's the word used, the phrase used, of land for 10 years, is entitled to make an application to the registrar under paragraph 1.1 one, one of the schedule. The registrar then receives it and um, <coughs> must give notice to various persons, most relevantly the paper owner, the, type, the, registered, the, sorry, the registered owner, and then the registered owner, if that person objects, it is required on the part of the applicant to then bring themselves, if they can, within the three conditions that we have touched upon. We can see that, so far as it's necessary, at page 298 of the external pagination, where the editors say this at the top of the page, by contrast, if a counter notice is served, um, that is, a counter notice served by the, typically the, re the registered proprietor, then the registrar must reject the squatter's application unless the squatter can show that he or she satisfies one of the three conditions. And there, and it is said in the next sentence, in the statutory declaration accompanying the original, that's the application, that's the original application made under one brackets one, the squatter must state whether he or she intends to rely upon any of the three grounds should a counter notice be served, and if so, state the facts that support that reliance. So it is built into the, the scheme of the act or the schedule that if the squatter is, is intending to rely on one of the conditions then he or she must state that right from the word go and of course it would be a dangerous thing not to do that because if you don't uh, state that you intend to rely on one of the three conditions and a counter notice is served then your application merely because a counter notice has been served will fall away so the the, the applicant who must demonstrate adverse possession, so-called, under 1-1, one, one, is in almost every situation going to have to, or be well advised to, state which of the three conditions he or she relies upon. And then we see further down the page, uh, at little d, the three grounds on which a squatter may be registered. If a counter notice is served, a squatter is only entitled to be registered if one of the three conditions is satisfied. Only the third condition is based solely upon adverse possession. Pausing there, that is the condition which, of course, finds its way into the Act itself at Section 98. But it is a very narrow ground, because it essentially involves um, the, the applicant owning a piece of land, and the, he or she is seeking to be registered in respect of a neighbouring piece of land. With this further super-added ingredient, which was unknown to the previous common law, of at all the statutory law of adverse possession, this super added ground that the applicant must must show that he or she believed that he owned the land. So it'll typically arise in a situation where the physical boundary doesn't doesn't demarcate precisely to the the registered boundary, and the person the, the applicant has been using the the, the 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 land which is technically not his or hers as their own, thinking it is their own for ten years. That's the scenario. Obviously not this scenario. So I say no more. About it. Then we have at 7095 the 
the estoppel ground. The first condition is that it would be unconscionable because of an equity by estoppel for the registered proprietor to seek to dispossess the applicant. And the circumstances are such that the applicant ought to be registered as proprietor. And then we see the reference at 542, Schedule 6, Para 5, <coughs> 2, which I don't need to take your lordships to unless you would be assisted, you'd be assisted by doing so. It is in the bundle earlier in the, earlier in the tabbing, but it's fairly stated, the, the provision there in McGarry and Wade. The situation is therefore where the squatter seeks to be registered according to the principle of proprietary estoppel so as to give effect to an equity that has risen in his or her favour. Uh, of course, and there's a whole chapter devoted in the Gary and Wade to that. To that, to, to that. And then we have uh, situations in which it would be unconscionable for an owner to dispossess a squatter by reason of such an equity are likely rare because the squatter is a trespasser, but they might occur as where a squatter mistakenly built on a neighbour's land thinking it to be his or her own. Uh, and the neighbour realising the squatter's mistake acquiesces in it. And we then see a reference at 544 to the Law Commission report, which I'm going to come on to presently. There may be cases which come before the court or the first tier tribunal in which an equity may have arisen in favour of a squatter, where the judge or the first tier tribunal considers that the squatter entitled to some relief, but not to the extent of being registered as a proprietor of the land. Of course, that is this case, subject to the question of what, or might be this case if your lordships uphold this appeal, um, subject to the question of what entitlement the squatter may have or the applicant may have, um, and whether he proves his facts. In such a circumstance, both the court under its equitable jurisdiction, brackets i.e. the county court here, and the first tier tri tribunal by statute have power to give effect to the equity by giving some less extensive relief. That, of course, depends on the facts. A squatter who considers that he or she is entitled to the land in question because of an equity arising by estoppel does not have to apply to the registrar to be registered under sched Schedule 6, but may instead take court proceedings in the usual way to establish the equity and to ask the court to give effect to it. And effectively, that is what, by amendment, is sought to be done here, save only that the, the squatter, or however you might want to designate that person, is a defendant rather than a claimant. Um, but what's being said there is that just because there is a condition of proprietary estoppel within the schedule doesn't mean that the courts, as are the courts, whether county court or high court, don't continue to exercise their normal equitable jurisdiction to give to 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 um, entertain pleas of proprietary estoppel and or constructive trust. Um, that's not affected in any way that juris that jurisdiction. Now, uh, my lords, the. It is worth now going to the Law Commission report, which founded the Act. Um, and we find that at tab 14 of the authorities bundle. And we can go straight to paragraph 14 slash 36, which is at page 189 of the external pagination. Where, of course, this is prior to the Act being in, in, enacted. This is the, um, the commission which is recommending the Act. 1436. If a, even if a recipient of the, of the notice of application, which is within the bill, for registration by the squatter serves a counter notice or the registrar, he must approve the squatter's application in three circumstances, and we can just deal with the first, where under the principles of proprietary stop, it would be uncontrolled for the registered proprietor to object to the squatter's application to be registered. So clearly, the understanding of the commission, which we say travels into the Act as, as passed, is that the, the first condition under paragraph 5 of Schedule 6 is intended to import the principles of a proprietary estoppel um, as a whole. Paragraph 14.37 just simply refers to the fact that there is still the power to seek to vindicate your rights in court action or by way of, by way of defence. It sets out the proposal in a little more detail. Over the page, please, page 190. 14.39, the principle of estoppel is, is set out, and in particular 14.40. Although these principles are stated in statutory form, they're intended to embody the actual principles. I, when I say statutory form, when it says that must be in, within, the, within the bill uh, intended to become statute, they're intended to embody the actual principles of proprietary estoppel as these have been developed. And then a reference to Bergarian and Wade. Um, the applicant will therefore have to establish that an equity has arisen in his or her favour. To this end, he will have to show that in some way 
the registered proprietor encouraged or allowed the applicant to believe that he or she owned the parcel of land in question. And I just pause there because just to, just to make clear, it is being proposed by the Law Commission and there is a bill which is intended to give effect to these proposals and that bill was enacted. That one could, within Schedule 6, as a person supposedly or so-called in adverse possession, make, a, make a, an application and be entitled to have your application successfully registered so that your title is registered if you can bring yourself within Condition 1. Condition 1 being uh, essentially the law of proprietary estoppel imported in its, in, in, in its totality. And of course, it is a <coughs> commonplace to say that the law of proprietary estoppel, although it manifests itself in all sorts of different ways, has at its core those three features that are enumerated at paragraph 14.40, the first of which, most importantly for my purposes, is that the registered proprietor or his agent, I might say, or her agent, encouraged or allowed the applicant to believe he or she owned the parcel of land in question. And again, pausing there, I would respectfully suggest that properly and fairly and justly read, what is pleaded at paragraph 6 through to 8 of the amended defence and counterclaim, i.e. including the paragraph 8 which uses the word licensee, is precisely that, essentially a scenario where the registered proprietor, via their alleged agents, Messrs Maloney and Quinn, have encouraged or allowed the applicant, i.e. Mr Frayne Senior, to believe that this was to be his land. Do with it what you will, Bill, or whatever the phrase might have been. Might have been. Well, it's quite interesting that um, both McGarry and Wade and the Law Commission talk about a squatter, the yes. act itself um, doesn't use that language, perhaps it's not thought to be very parliamentary, <laughs> but, but um, one would think of a squatter as being somebody who is there unlawfully or without permission. Quite, quite so, and, and, and that, that's why one thinks the word, the word squatter is actually being used inappositely and possibly overly loosely, uh, loosely I would respectfully suggest in McGarry and Wade. Um, at, when, because it, it's just simply a, a, an inaccurate characterization of the person who can get themselves within the, the criteria of 1440 being described as a squatter. And, and that. The, the Law Commission report itself refers to the adverse possessor as a squatter. Yes. Numerous well, but that, but that, 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 is, that is simply a designation to, to, designed to, without. without presuming what, what the, the characteristic the necessary characteristics of that squatter might be. And one and, and if I may say so, my lord, if one turns the page to page one nine one of the external pagination, fourteen point four two, where we have the two examples that are given, which were the subject of debate before the learned judge below, which she deals with in her in her judgment. Now the the first Example is, of course, the person going on the other person's land, mistakenly believing it that she's the owner, and there's knowing acquiescence. Now, one might take take the, the view that the word squatter there is is being used in a pretty um, loose and possibly inapposite way. Well, but the well, because well, in this in this situation, as the judge said, if it's just acquiescence, there's no actual consent. There's no actual. Just acquiescence. Yes, but well, so why isn't that person a squatter? Well, I suppose I mean, one could be having having debates about the precise the precise English language meaning of the word squatter and whether that carries with it some sort of uh, uh, mens rea. And I I am coming to squat on your land, knowing it is not my land, and I am seeking um, nonetheless to invade your your territory. But that's not a debate which would be of great assistance to your lordships. But but if we go to the second example, which is an example which is intended and understood, would be within the ambit of Schedule 6, both paragraph 1 and paragraph 5, where neighbours have entered into an informal sale agreement for valuable consideration by which one agrees to sell the land to the other. The buyer pays the price, takes possession of the land, treats it at his own, no steps are taken to perfect his or her title. No binding contract, either because the agreement does not comply with the formal requirements for such a contract, or etc., etc. The buyer discovers that he or she has no title to the land. If he or she has been in possession of it for 10 years, he or she can be applied 
apply to be registered as proprietor. Now, on no view in my respectful submission, in using the understood language, uh, un understood meaning of the word uh, squatter, could that the person in that scenario be described as a squatter? And, and let's get away from the word squatter because it may have different meanings to different people, I understand that. But let's ask this question. Has that person, in that hypothetical example, used by the Law Commission to illuminate the law in action as it understands it will become in action, is that person occupying the land without the consent or permission of the registered owner? Answer, I respectfully suggest to your lordships, obviously not. That person has entered into possession of the land absolutely with the consent and permission of the owner because the owner takes the view that he or she has conveyed and given and, and, and sold that land to the to the to the applicant and really we are not very far removed in my respectful submission considering that that example from the facts pleaded in this case a and what that shows in my respectful submission and by importing as parliament has seen fit to do importing into the apparatus of Schedule 6 the conception of proprietary estoppel in all its manifestations, it cannot be the case that at the very same time Parliament has said in order to make an application you have to be in adverse possession and at the very same time that application can only succeed unless you're within conditions 2 and 3 if you are able to make out an, estoppel, an equity by estoppel those two concept those two conceptions must coexist. They cannot not they cannot be internally inconsistent because that would make a nonsense of Schedule Six in my respectful submission and make a nonsense of the the reasoning of the Law Commission, which actually gave rise to the Act in the in the in the, in the first place. And I just go back to page one nineteen. It is understood by the Law Commission and adopted by the Parliament that a person could be in adverse possession in circumstances where, quotes, the registered proprietor encouraged or allowed the applicant to believe that he or she owned the parcel of land. Pausing there, that's this case, if we make out the facts as sought to be pleaded by way of amendment. It's precisely this case. Messrs Maloney and Quinn saying to Mr Frame Senior, it's yours, with whatever language was used. It's yours. Treat it as your own. And what the judge says is no. Because that's the licenship really being pleaded. What the judge says is no. By, by pleading that Messrs Maloney and Quinn have said to you, Mr Frayne, it's your, it's your land, old boy, or whatever they, whatever they said, they are necessarily destroying the conception of adverse possession. That just can't be right. Because it makes a nonsense of the apparatus and machinery of the Act in my respectful submission. Now, this point has been considered by the First Tier Tribunal, which I accept, of course, is in no way or shape binding on this court, but nonetheless shows how the schedule works in action. And that is a case called Ashworth and Stroud, decided in 2021 tab 13 of your Lordship's bundle in which Mr Hackett, my learned junior, acted for the unsuccessful respondents, taking essentially the point taken by the judge, <coughs> by coincidence. And my Lords, that is a long judgment, which I do not need to detain your Lordships with the, the detailed facts of. But the, the, the essence of the case is can be picked up at page 152 of the in, external pagination. The essence of the case is as follows. A, a gentleman called Bigland owns land and Mr Ashworth, the applicant, is his neighbour. Bigland, as we see at paragraph 57, Roman 1, makes a clear and unequivocal assurance and promise to Ashworth that if he, that is Ashworth, pays him £10,000 and constructs a dividing wall at his expense on Bigland's land, that is, Mr. Ashworth would be the owner of what is now the disputed land. Aye, you can, we've got, we've, there's some land close to Ashworth's land. 
you can build and basically enclose that land if you build a wall and pay me £10,000. Two, in specific reliance on that assurance and promise, Ashworth paid the 10000 and built the wall. At three, at that point, an equity by estoppel arose in the absence of the required contractual transfer formalities. Had Bigland turned back, turned around and asked for the money back, I think that must be gave, offered the money back, because Bigland actually received the money, had the wall to be turned down, he would have been a stop from denying the assurance, reliance and bargain. That's over the page. Four, as to the issue of stop and relief, in my submission, that sent, that, and then there's a, we don't need to, we need to worry about, go into that. Now, so those facts are not far removed, in my respectful submission, from our current facts. Mr. Hackett takes the point that the claimant takes, para 58. He said, that can't work. Because putting aside your rights to, to estoppel, you've got to prove that you're in adverse possession, you, Mr. Ashworth, who's chosen to go about vindicating your estoppel in this particular statutory way under the schedule. So Mr. Hackett, paragraph 58, submits that the possession of the applicant could not be regarded as adverse for the purpose of the act because he'd entered into possession of the land with the license or consent of Bigland, Mr. Bigland. He sought, therefore, to rely on those cases, establishing uncontroversially that the possession of a license, by, by definition, someone who enters land pursuant to a permission or consent, is not adverse. And then there are some authorities cited. Reference also made at my invitation to those cases on the position of a purchaser under contract who enters into possession prior to completion, bridges and means, which we, rely, we refer to in our skeleton argument. Um, Para 59, over the page, I consider this submission as misconceived and inapplicable on facts such as these. In the oral contract proprietary estoppel situation, I believe that's a reference to the type of scenario where the dealings between the parties is to be treated as tantamount to an oral contract or has, has some qualities of, a, of some sort of informal agreement. The whole base of the possession taken is that, is that it is as of assumed and assured right and entitlement to the land. Not that the possessor has a mere temporary or revo re revocable permission or license. And again, I say, well, let's just pause there and swing back to our facts in this case. And uh, I, I say they're rather, rather tellingly similar. The assurance of reliance upon it generates an independent proprietary entitlement and an equitable an equity by estoppel. It's inapposite to characterize that as possession by license or consent. Alternatively, the oral contract situation where the full price has been paid. I consider the position to be analogous to that in Bridges and Mees. Further, as I said in, pointed out in oral argument, every estoppel case has, by its very nature, an element of consensus in the possession of the land or exercise of the right assured. The whole point of the doctrine is that this possession or exercise arises from something which is quite like, but is not quite, an agreement or consensual arrangement. Again, what else was it other than Maloney and Quinn saying to Frey and Senior, you can have, you've, you've done us some good turns over the past years, you can have the property, and, and Frayn acts, Mr. Frayn acts upon that. And then, finally, yet Parliament and Law Commission, in its detailed commentary on the then land registration bill, clearly assumed by an act in Schedule 6, Para 52, that an act, an equity by estoppel, could coexist, coexist, with adverse permission, possession of the land subject to estoppel. If that were the position, that possession by virtue, if it were the position that possession by virtue of facts giving rise from the estoppel, by a stop, equity by a stop, namely assurance, reliance, and detriment, could not be adverse. This would rob the provision of almost all its applicability and content. And I, and then we see paragraph 61, which I don't quote, um, where they refer to the second example, which I've already shown uh, your lordships, and, and I, I, I don't say anything more about that. Now, it is right to say, as my learned friends rightly and under, well, understandably point out, the, me, the, the, the roof and roper paragraph 20, seek to confront that difficulty where they suggest, and this is page 317, 318, external pagination, that there have to be limits on the effect of the first condition. This is right at the bottom, 33.043. It only applies with the remedy which the squatter is awarded to enforce his equitable right as an entitlement to be registered as proprietor of the state. I've got no quarrel with that. Not confer any greater time on the squatter than the court determined in its discretion. It was not unconscionable 
that the proprietor enforces his right to possession of property. Nor would it affect the case where the, the court determined that the squatter should remain in occupation of the pro property other than as registered proprietor. And then secondly, the facts which the squatter relies on to found the estoppel may bar him from arguing that he was in adverse possession. This would be the case of the proprietor expressly or impliedly permitted the squatter to occupy the land in addition to his representation. And your lordships can read on to the end of that mini paragraph. Now, what Roof and Roper seems to be suggesting is that high, uh, wholly contrary to the Law Commission's understanding of what the bill meant was intended to convey, and I say wholly contrary to the actual words of the Act, which do not, dis, which do not delimit the, the ambit of Condition 1 in Paragraph 5, that they're saying there has to be carved out of Condition 1 of Paragraph 5 all those cases of express or implied permission, which is an evisceration on a grand scale, of course. There will be very few estoppels which don't involve some form of express or implied permission for the squatter to occupy the land. So I say that can't be right. And I also note in passing that there is, ta at, at footnote 65, we see page 327, two cases referred to in footnote 65, Pasco and Turner and Voice and Voice would fall outside the condition because in both cases the proprietor permitted the claimant to occupy the property. So Voice and Voice is apparently sub silencio outside the outside condition one. But, but come, that would come as news to the Law Commission because when it was debated, discussing this question back at tab 14, page 190, external pagination, footnote 141, where they're, where they're explaining the width of the proprietary estoppel rights or the proprietary estoppel doctrine embraced by the Act, what are the cases cited? Pasco and Turner and Voice and Voice. My Lord, Roof and Rover can't be right. My Lord, I'm, I'm conscious that I have overextended. I, I, I'm now um, beyond the 20 minutes, and I, I will try and wrap up. The, what we suggest is that it simply cannot be right that the conception, the old conception of adverse possession, as embraced by the, the, the learning that has developed over the centuries, has been in absolute form imported into the statutory machinery of Schedule 6. It can't be right because that very statutory machinery doesn't simply allow proprietary estoppel to somehow coexist. It makes in, in one of the three conditions applicable it, an obligation on the part of the applicant who says he's in adverse possession to bring himself within a proprietary estoppel in its fullest sense. Um, my lords, those are my. We've set this out in greater detail now, skeleton article, of course, but at conscious of the time, those are my submissions on that point. And those are the submissions which I say show that the judge was wrong with respect to rule, as she did, <coughs> that paragraphs 8 and 13, assuming they had the meaning and intention that she ascribed to them, were implacably and fundamentally at odds with each other, such that the plea of adverse possession, assuming brackets if it was possible, it could be entertained by the courts, um, was it, was it, that therefore the adverse possession plea was bound to fail because of its juxtaposition with paragraph eight. My lords, I wanted to say finally one thing about ground one, if I may, because I spent some time over the. Before you go back to now, ground one, do you want to say anything about paragraph 11 of Schedule 6, which seems to tie the concept of adverse possession in the 2002 Act? No, I understand that. To the Limitation Act? No, I, I, I understand that, and we've addressed that in our skeleton argument. And the. the I mean, one. one it's, it's done in a relatively. If we, we can go to it, it's page one, page 17 of the, of the... It tells you what a person is in adverse possession of land for the purposes of the 2002 Act is. 
A person is in adverse possession of an estate in land for the purposes of this schedule if but for section 96, a period of limitation under section 15 would run in his favour. All that's said, but if we then go to section 15, my lord, tab 1, page 5, all that is said there is what no action shall be brought by any person to recover any land after the expiration of 12 years from the date on which the right of action accrued to him, or if it first accrued to some person through him, um, whom he claims to that person. Nothing more is said about the conception of adverse possession in section 15 of the, of, of, of the, limit, of the Limitation Act. I know the point I'm seeking to make is that one has to give the first condition a proper meaning. And if my learned friends are right, and if the judge below is right, then essentially what one's saying an applicant for adverse possession must prove that he is within the first condition if he can't prove he's in the second and third. But at the very same, at the very same time, one's saying that you can't, in the, in the vast majority of cases, you can't be within the first condition <coughs> if you're in adverse possession, or vice versa. That can't be right. And it would have, it would undermine the statutory purpose of Schedule 6, which is designed to create a short way of, an in in inexpensive way of dealing with these kind of cases, which are typically going to be involving relatively small plots of land, possibly involving limited sums of money. And, and to make, just to, to pick up on that, my lord, if one, if I could invite the court to turn to page 241 of the bundle, tab 16, this is, we're now at Mr. Stephen Jordan and Mr. Oliver Bradley Gardner's work on adverse possession, second edition, which I think was dated 2011. So just before we go there, was, was paragraph 11 of Schedule 1 in the draft bill that was put forward by the Law Commission? That's a question I can't answer. I, I assume it was, but, I, I, but that, is a, that is merely an assumption on my part. Well, that may be of some significance. Can we, can we provide your Lordship with... Um, Indication of uh, assistance. So I'm sorry I can't assist your lordship now. Maybe I'm only Frank, I don't know. Para 27. The, 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 this is Messrs. This is, this is Jordan on adverse possession. Page 474 over the page, that's um, uh, 240 of the external pagination. They're, they're dealing with Para 52. Sorry, it's, it's my fault. Could you just give me the reference again? Page tab, 240, tab. my lord, tab 16. So they're now dealing with the, the first condition, although it's the 5-2 condition. 2275, this gives statutory effect to the principle of proprietary stock. Not, not one notes, statutory effect the principle of proprietary stock, all brackets, save in 80% of cases of proprietary stock, or, or whatever. They, they, they then set out what how that works. They then set out over the page the two examples <coughs> given by the final report without noting that, that those examples might be problematic. And then this. In reality, this condition is of little significance. Any squatter able to make out this condition will be entitled to relief and equity from the court in any event, which, of course, is, is completely right. And... and um, You know, one, one, one feels like if, if this had been dealt with in a particular way a year ago, we might have had a trial in this case by now. We'd be entitled to relief and equity from the, the court in any event, without having to establish that he had been in adverse possession for any particular period. The only relative of this condition is a squatter who's been in adverse possession for 10 or more years, but who is also entitled to be registered propriety by, reason, propriety by reason of proprietary stop or can assert his claim by an application to the land registry, and if the, if the claim is disputed before the adjudicator, which is likely to be less expensive than court proceedings. Now, that, that I entirely, with respect to Mr. Jordan, adopt and, and, and agree and, and, and advance to your lordships. Um, it's a statutory purpose that would be undermined very considerably if it turned out, uh, putting aside the wording of the Act, which says nothing of kind, that in fact, Right, Stoppel has not been imported into the Act, but only a, a, a tiny subset of 
proprietary estoppels that have been ported into the Act. My Lords, I'm conscious that I'm trespassing on my learned friend's time. I wanted to just say one final thing about Brown 1, having spent some time over the short adjournment looking back over Mr. Lewis's submissions. And it really is taking up a point which my Lord, Lord Justice Mayers, um, brought up in, 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 in argument. I'm grateful to the learned judge. Um, back to supplemental bundle, please, page 48. These were the last, almost the last submissions made by Mr. Lewis. Having made some submissions about possibly amending paragraph 8, he finally says, and this is really almost the end of his submissions, after judgment's been given, of course, the substantive judgment, End of the page. Your Honour, the court can make conditions upon giving permission, the only element, and then this, and I know my Lord, my, my Lord is already ahead of me on this, and I'm grateful. The only element of this document, in accordance with the court's judgment today, for which should submission permission should not be given, and then, and then I don't understand what precisely that means, albeit I'm asking for the indulgence to correct that, is paragraph 13, the assertion of adverse possession, because paragraph 14 clearly asserts that an extra estoppel that is being dealt with by the court below, those findings have not been challenged on this appeal, and so on, and so on. I think that the indulgence he's asking for is to correct what is said about um, uh, the authority of Messrs Quinlan and whoever the other Maloney to run the alternative. Yes, so, so that, thank, you, Michael. thank you, Michael. That's, very, that's, that's helpful, because, because on that basis, what he's saying on the, in the final analysis, what he was saying to the court was, look, I am seeking an indulge, I'm seeking an indulge, that's the right word, and I'm not going to quibble about that, if you'd allow me to amend, to tinker with paragraph eight. But even putting that to one side, the logic of your honour's judgment, says Mr. Lewis, and the inexorable logic is that the one paragraph that has to go, putting aside whatever else I may be seeking by way of indulgence from your honour, by way of retinkering. If I'm wrong about that, if that goes away, the one core thing that necessarily, flow, necessarily flows from your Lord, your honour's judgment is that paragraph 13 has to go. He acknowledges and accepts that in the final analysis. No, that's not his final position. Because if we go over the page, what he says Whilst the court has found ground one is made out, paragraph eight of the amended pleadings cannot stand alongside paragraph 13, the affirmative of adverse possession and the affirmative of a license. It can plainly be resolved, rather than simply saying permission is refused altogether. My submission is more proportionate, given where we are at this stage of litigation, given the usual cost of the, the, the prejudice view, bad up my learning points. If we want to have another crack, I ask the court grant that injunctions to have another crack. Yeah, absolutely. So the, so the end point is not, please, delete par paragraph 13 and leave paragraph 8 as it is for the time being. No, no. It is, can I have the indulgence to have another fresh go at it? No, no, no I understand that. But what, I think, what I think Mr. Lewis is saying there, what I suggest Mr. Lewis is saying there, is that on the, on the logic of your honour's judgment, Putting aside anything else, paragraph 13 has to go. I am inviting your honour to allow me to, to do some more tinkering. But the, 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 the core, the, the bare minimum that emerges from your lordship, your honour's judgment is that paragraph 13 has to go. That has, on any view, that has to go. Can I do some tinkering? The judge says you can't do any tinkering. But she, what she doesn't then go on to do and say, but on the logic of my own judgment, as has been pointed out to me by Mr Lewis, the only thing that goes is paragraph 13. Whether Mr. Lewis wants to then carry on thereafter trying to re-amend paragraph 8 if he, if he wishes to, that's another matter. But the logic of the judgment is that paragraph 13 and only paragraph 13 have to go. That's the submission I, 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 I make. I've detained your, detained your lordships long enough. Thank you for your indulgence. Those are my submissions. Yes. All right. Well, thank you very much. We're going to just rise for a while. A short, a short while.
We don't need to trouble you on ground one. We would like to hear from you on uh, the specific aspects of ground two concerned with the second example uh, in the Law Commission report um, uh, and the first tier tribunal decision, which do appear to allow for the possibility that uh, adverse permission may be with some sort of permission of the registered owner. So if you could uh, concentrate on those points, we would be assisted. I'm grateful, my lord. The, the overarching point that I would make to your lordships about that um, permission, uh, uh, as, it's, as it's framed, is that it, it isn't permission 
uh, that is given in the examples. Um, and specifically in relation to the circumstances where uh, a purchase price is, is paid in the cases uh, that are cited by my learned friends uh, in, in, our, in their skeleton arguments. Um, those are not characterised in my submission as ones where consent has been given to them to occupy. Um, and the, the key factor here is, is whether the paper owner of the land, the, the person who has sold the land and um, allowed the purchaser into possession, whether that person could maintain an action in possession. That's really the key issue here. Uh, it's, no, it's not necessarily um, helpful in my submission to characterise it purely as one of consent. It's also one of um, whether an action in trespass uh, would be maintainable. Um, and in fact, your lordships, in my submission, would be assisted by um, coming to the passages from adverse possession uh, by Jordan uh, KC and Oliver Radley Gardner KC, um, where they deal with the issues of beneficiaries in possession to the exclusion of trustee. Now that's at uh, tab 16 of your lordship's authorities bundle. And page, I'm afraid the page numbering is not so clear with the photocopy. Um, but if, if you turn um, 238 and then turn over to chapter 28, that is where you will find um, the passages that I'm going to take your lordship you can use the pagination in the book if that's easier. Uh, of course, yes. Page 590. Right. So the, the learned authors helpfully set out the problem in paragraph 2801. In a variety of situations, the legal title to property is in A, but B is entitled to be in possession in equity. In such a situation, can the possession of B adverse so that time runs against A? There are two possible solutions. Uh, and I, I'm going to refer to solution, uh, or rather, uh, number two. Time will not run against A unless B is not entitled to possession, so that B's possession is wrongful, and A would be entitled to recover possession from B. And the authors say there have been a number of decisions on this point that are very difficult to reconcile, and many of them were based on the old rule that time runs against a landlord under a tenancy at will. From the first anniversary of the grant of the tenancy, which applied between 1833 and 1980. This chapter reviews the decisions and suggests that the second solution is the correct one. Um, they, they say that there are a number of situations in which this problem can arise. Three types of cases have been considered by the courts where land was in the possession of someone entitled to possession in equity, but who did not have legal title. Uh, and then one, two, and then uh, over the page is the relevant passage. The position of a contracting purchaser who has paid the purchase price but not taken a conveyance was considered in Bridges and Meads, which is the case cited um, by my learned friends. Now, they say the words um, in their words, uh, what supports their analysis about the operation of the Act uh, of Schedule 6, Paragraph 5.2, is um, Paragraph 14.42 uh, of the Law Commission's report. And they would have your Lordships believe that the Law Commission examples and their case involves a registered proprietor permitting the occupier to be on their land and that accordingly, by implication, the adverse possession is now inconsistent, uh, not inconsistent with possession under a license. And I say that's not the correct analysis. The status of a buyer who pays the full purchase price and enters into possession where no steps were taken to perfect the title was, as I said, considered in Bridges and Mees, on which the appellants rely. In that case, I think my learned friend has taken you to the facts, but I'll just briefly recite them. In that case, the plaintiff entered into a contract for the sale of land. He paid a deposit, entered into possession in 1936, and then paid the balance in 1937. He was never registered as a proprietor. 
More than 12 years later, the vendor became insolvent and their liquidators sold the property to the defendant in 1956. The plaintiff claimed to have acquired the land by adverse possession. Mr. Justice Harmon, in deciding the case in favour of the plaintiff, decided the possession of land by a beneficiary under a bare trust was adverse to the bare trustee. Now, of course, a contrary decision was reached in the case of Hyde and Pierce, which is another of the cases that's cited. Um, and in that case, um, by a contract dated 12th of March 1958, the plaintiff agreed to purchase land. That contract provided that if he went into occupation, he would do so as licensee until the sale completed. He went into occupation, and thereafter a dispute arose about land which was not included in the sale and how much of the purchase price should be decreased. The plaintiff was permitted to remain there until 1972 when the vendor sold the property to the defendant. The defendant took possession after the plaintiff was sent to prison. The plaintiff claimed that he had adversely possessed the land and the Court of Appeal held that he occupied under the contract for sale such that time did not begin to run and his possession was not adverse. Now those two decisions don't sit easily along one, alongside one another uh, and attempts have been made to harmonise them on the basis that the purchaser was, purchaser was absolutely entitled in Bridges, but in Hyde, uh, per um, Lord Justice Templeman, there was still something to be done in the ascertainment of the purchase price and the payment of the purchase price. And um, Emmett and Farrand deal with that. But um, I just want to then return, having set out the facts, to Jordan on, on this point. Now, Jordan considers both cases in, in some detail. And uh, at uh, 2829, which is on page 601 of the internal pagination, the learned authors say that the result in Bridges and Mees can be justified on the alternative basis on which Harmon J put his judgment, namely that the contract to acquire property was an overriding interest. But it's questionable whether his decision on the adverse po uh, possession point was correct. Um, what, what I say about Bridges and Mees and these cases is what is crucial, as I said at the outset of my submissions, is whether uh, the uh, paper owner can maintain an action in possession against uh, the um, person in occupation as to, uh, to test whether or not they are indeed in adverse possession. So um, if one goes in with, one's, with a license or consent, uh, then uh, you cannot be in adverse possession because you possess property under the permission um, of the um, paper owner. Similarly, you can't maintain an action in possession uh, against uh, the purchaser where they are effectively the equitable owner because on an action for possession, their defence will be, I am the owner in equity. And um, either what will happen, uh, as the analysis in Jordan uh, says, uh, in respect of uh, the second of those two cases in Hyde and Pierce, which is, they, they suggest that probably the correct result is that um, in that situation, if there is a specifically enforceable contract, <coughs> then that would defeat an action uh, for possession made by the paper title owner. Um, and of course, that follows the rule that uh, where the common law and equity conflict, the equitable position will prevail. So if someone has purchased the property um, and they are the owners in equity, they're not going to be defeated uh, absent some provision in the contract, for example. Um, they're not, their possession is not going to be defeated by an action by the paper owner. So was the Law Commission wrong to think that the second example was a case where someone was in adverse Yes. I go as far as to say the Law Commission's example is wrong. I, we say that as much in our skeleton argument. If, if the Law Commission's example is impossible to reconcile with the case law and um, there, there is too much, and I don't intend to read it to your Lordships, this chapter by Jordan, I respectfully commend to your Lordships as a correct statement of the law. Uh, if the law, uh, law Commission's example conflicts with that statement of the law, then it is wrong. Uh, and in any event, it is not statute. Uh, the, the, the principle in 
um, Pepper and Hart uh, that um, the Law Commission report or indeed proceedings in the Houses of Parliament can be used as a statutory aid to interpretation applies where um, the statute is just not clear uh, or, or it can't it doesn't have a clear plain meaning I, I would suggest that the statute does have a clear and plain meaning uh, for the reasons that we fully set out in our skeleton arguments and I'm mindful that I'm limiting my submissions to the two areas uh, that your lordship require my uh, submissions on but um, the, the, the overarching point I make is that this is just a report of the Law Commission and Parliament enacted uh, the 2002 Act of course on the recommendation of the Law Commission but it doesn't follow that because they use those examples that um, they are um, uh, what Parliament intended to enact and in, in any event I, I say that um, uh, what is clear is that um, the question, the first question to ask is um, uh, when deciding whether uh, a claimant was in adverse possession was whether that permission was by consent and then the uh, related question which is can the paper owner maintain an action in possession uh, against them? If they can't um, then it was either uh, by consent uh, or, or it was because they are, in fact, not the owner in equity in any event. Uh, do you know the answer to my Lord's question about whether paragraph 11 formed part of the Law Commission Bill? I do, yes, it, it did form part of the report. So it, it, it did or it didn't? It did. It did. Uh, and I'll, I'll Thank get you. the reference to your Lordship. It's paragraph 1420 of the report. Uh, which is at uh, page 181 of the authorities bundle. Just above the number paragraphs 1 and 2. For these purposes and subject to what is said in paragraph 14.23 below, adverse possession has the same meaning as it does under the Limitation Act 1980. Bill provides that a person is in adverse possession of an estate in land if but for clause 95, a period of limitation under section 15 of the Limitation Act would run in his or her favour in relation to the estate. So it's clearly contemplated by the Law Commission in their report uh, and in fact that was enacted um, into the statute uh, as your Lordships have seen in uh, paragraph 11 of schedule 6. In fact there's a footnote reference to what is schedule 6 paragraph 11 one yes. of the bill. Uh, so so it, it indeed was in the contemplation of, of the Law Commission. And can I just deal with um, uh, a point that my learned friend said in his submissions on this, uh, where he said that, that Section 15 of the Limitation Act doesn't address what is adverse possession. Well, I, I would respectfully suggest that you have hundreds of years of um, jurisprudence to assist on that. It, plainly, the Act means, uh, the 2002 Act means, that the pre-existing the pre law um, prior to uh, October 2003 continues to apply um, as to the meaning of adverse possession. Uh, and, and I should say also in relation to the point uh, about Bridges and Mead, that if it's necessary to decide the point, we say that um, Bridges and Mead is wrong uh, and decided wrongly um, for the reasons that is set out uh, in Adverse Possession, paragraph 28-29, which is at page 244 of the Authorities Bundle. Um, and, and in particular, time doesn't run because the trustee is holding land on their trust uh, for a beneficiary and doesn't have that right of action that I referred to. Um, finally, um, my, my learned friends rely on the first tribunal, ca first tier tribunal case of Ashworth in support of their suggestion uh, that possession need no longer be without the permission of the adverse. Um, in my submission, that's not what the case says. The facts of the case were not too dissimilar from Bridges and Mees, in that there had been an informal sale agreement in 2004 between the applicant and his neighbour for a strip of land. 
the applicant paid the purchase price in full and enclosed the land by building a wall, but his neighbour never attempted to attend to the formalities. During his divorce two years after the sale, the neighbour conveyed the land to his ex-wife, who then sold it to the respondents in October 2016. They demolished the wall in Christmas 2018, and the applicant applied for adverse possession on the first condition, and the first tier tribunal found he was entitled to be registered. The issue of uh, possession by licence arose, and Tribunal Judge Patton uh, said at paragraph 59, which is at uh, 154 of the authorities bundle, <coughs> I consider that the submission is misconceived and in inapplicable on facts such as these. In the oral contract proprietary estoppel situation, the whole basis of the possession is possession taken is that it is as, as of assumed and assured right and entitlement to the land, not that the possessor has a mere temporary or revocable permission or license from the owner to be there. The assurance and reliance upon it generates an independent proprietary entitlement, an equity by estoppel. It is inapposite to characterise that possession as a license or consent. Alternatively, in the oral contract situation where the full price has been paid, I consider the position to be analogous to that in Bridges and Meads. So that's the key distinction here, that it's not about consent. Um, and I make the point that acquiescence is not consent um, in the same way that um, going into possession following an informal purchase is not about consent. Both parties believe that the person occupying the land, whether it's by enclosing it as they did uh, in Ashworth uh, or in Bridges and Mees by going into possession of the, of the house, uh, both parties believe that, that the purchaser is the owner uh, and there is no question of consent. Um, they, uh, there is also, of course, the um, submission that I've made that um, one could not maintain an action in possession against that purchaser uh, or the person relying on um, the acquiescence um, because of the um, equity that arises as a result of that. But it, this is why my learned friend in my submission seeks to characterise licence as something very wide-ranging and, uh, uh, and, and wide enough to encompass something more than merely consent. Um, my Lord, Lord Justice Nuji I think made the point to my learned friend that um, consent really does, uh, license rather, really does just mean consent. And, and that is what the ordinary meaning of the word uh, is. It's, it's um, the consent of the owner of the land or the possessor of the land, to be more precise, uh, to go into possession of it. It, it isn't wider than that. Uh, and th what my learned friend's submissions attempt to do is to cure by uh, a creative use of language, the inherent defects that existed in the pleading. Sorry, I'm now a bit confused. In the Bridges and Mees type case, do you say that the purchaser who pays the money and enters under an informal and unenforceable contract, oral contract, is or is not in adverse? Um, uh, in so far as the paper title owner cannot maintain an action in possession, they are not in adverse possession. So the, you have to say what the first tier tribunal said in Ashworth was wrong, because in that case they said it is like Bridges and Meese and you are in adverse possession and therefore I can deal with it under schedule. Well, if... Uh, I, would, I would suggest that, um, that under Schedule 6 it is not possible uh, to use um, paragraph five to um, bring to to import uh, into the rules about adverse possession uh, situations such as where um, a person has gone into possession uh, without consent, uh, and those situations are ones where no consent. Uh, has been given, such as in, in Bridges and Meads. No consent is uh, required. Uh, and the person in adverse possession, um, sorry, the person in occupation uh, occupies under 
um, their equitable right to do so. Yes, but it follows from that they're not in adverse possession, and therefore you can't use Schedule Six. Yes. So the first tier tribunal, the North Commission, was wrong to say this is like Bridges and Meads, and therefore um, the informal purchaser is in adverse possession, and I can do all the other schedules. Uh, yes, if, if I said the, the, the converse to that, my lord, then yes, that, that, that is correct, that they were wrong to say it's analogous to Bridges and Meads. Why is it wrong to say it's analogous to Bridges and Meads? Um, because it was a case where there was an informal contract, and, and the, the purchaser had paid the £10,000 and had billed the law to cost of a third of £600. Why is that not just like Bridges and Meads? Well, it, it's, uh, it, it is an informal um, uh, agreement for the sale of land. Um, perhaps... Um, Perhaps what I've said has been has perhaps been lost on uh, entirely my own fault, but uh, has been lost along the way. Um, what I am what I am saying uh, is that um, it is not possible, as a fundamental submission, uh, for adverse possession to be uh, someone to claim adverse possession where they have the consent of the paper owner, and that is the fundamental principle uh, of the appellant's case. They say um, that because of the, um, the words that were spoken um, uh, about, I think my little friend characterizes, all this is now yours, you've done a, a good turn, etc., that that is enough uh, to give rise um, to an adverse, uh, an adverse possessor uh, or, or the rights to claim adverse possession. Um, I say that that is not correct. Um, the Act does not envisage a consent such as that or positive words spoken, um, such as those that were allegedly spoken, uh, to give rise uh, to an entitlement to be registered as an adverse possessor. Right. So I think I understand that. But, but, but if you have consent, permission, let's get away from the word license. But, but the, the, the true, the paper owner says it's yours. You can go into occupation. Then it, the occupation is not adverse possession. That's your position. Yes. That means the Law Commission, or both Mr. Justice Harmon and Bridges and Means, and the Law Commission in their second example were wrong because those were exactly cases where the paper owner said to the purchaser, "You can go into occupation." Uh, yes, but it's well, it, it isn't characterised as consent per se. Um, because when one thinks about consent in, in relation to adverse possession, one thinks of a, a license. You can go in, you can occupy uh, for a given period of time. You might have, for example, even a lease, an estate in the land. Um, and in those situations, one is let into possession under a consent. Um, I, I would suggest that there is a material difference between that and where um, there's an informal sale. Um, and it's the informal um, uh, uh, sale examples um, those are not ones where consent is given. It's because uh, you are entitled to be in possession because you are the owner in equity. But in either case, the uh, paper owner has consented to the um, other person taking possession of the land. It doesn't make any difference from that uh, point of view whether they have done so because they given a license saying something, well, it's my land, but I'm quite happy to occupy it, or whether they think they've made a contract to sell it so that they mistakenly think that title has passed. Either way, they're perfectly happy and willing for the other fellow to be there. Yes, but they're not, they're not the types of scenarios that are uh, envisaged by um, Schedule 6. So Schedule 6 is, is motivated to providing a, a, an entitlement to be registered where you haven't entered in, in, into possession uh, with the consent of the owner. You've adversely possessed the land for 10 years. And um, in those scenarios, you have other rights to vindicate uh, your right to stay in possession. So you don't need to rely on adverse possession where you've gone into possession of the land because you are a, um, 
uh, an, a purchaser under an informal contract. Well, if you're right about Schedule 6 and adverse possession having the same meaning for the purpose of registered land as it does for unregistered land, that's all very well, but, but in order to make that submission, the Law Commission have to be mistaken about their second example. Yes, which, which, you said which I, I've already but said, that, that is, if I have to go that far. That that is, I, I think that is what you have to say. I think you have to say the Law Commission was wrong, Mr Justice Harmon was wrong, and the First Tier Tribunal in Ashworth. Yes, and in fact, that's what Jordan on adverse possession also says, and that's why I say I commend that's, it to your that's lordship. Your, that's your position. Yes. And, and that I is saying, on the putative facts of this case, you can have the property. You say that is a case of an informal arrangement, which is not generative of adverse possession. Is that right? Yes, I, I say that, but it's but it's more nuanced than that, or it's, it's, it's not as straightforward as that, because... Um, uh, the, the, because of the inconsistency, the internal inconsistencies and contradictions in the pleading, uh, they, they don't just say you can go into possession; it's yours. It, it's it's not quite as clear cut as that. In the in the pleading, it suggested that they were licensees. I think it's um, suggested somewhere that it's it's laughable that they could be in possession for so long and not have a license. So there are these internal inconsistencies and contradictions throughout the pleading, where it's not just a simple case of, I was told this is yours and that is the end of it. They plead, as the learned judge said, at first instance, three causes of action or defences. And they are not, uh, that they are internally contradictory. But what I say is that if there is um, a, a promise that you can have the property uh, and then you go into possession of it, um, that is not a situation uh, where you can invoke uh, the uh, Schedule 6 uh, and use the principles of adverse possession uh, to obtain title. You must rely uh, on your equitable rights, whatever that equitable right Which might means be. means you have to go to court, you can't do it through, yes, through the... Can I, I just ask you, there was some reference to the adjudicator. Did, at the time the 2002 Act was passed, that was the, the dispute resolution mechanism. It was. And registration, and that's now been replaced by the first tier tribunal. That's correct, my lord. And, and then uh, I had another question. Well, I've now forgotten what it was. So can yeah. I... While you're, while you're on memory, can I ask one? Um, the, if I've noted you correctly, the, there were two alternatives, I think they were meant to be alternatives, uh, in the examples that we've been discussing as to what prevented the particular example involving adverse possession. One was, I think you submitted, that if someone is occupying under an equitable right, that can't amount to adverse possession, and the other was that if someone's in possession with the consent of the owner, that can't amount to uh, adverse possession. But yes. Th 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 those have, I think, rather different ramifications. Um, if uh, it's just uh, those who have the consent of the paper owner, and that's what prevents it being adverse possession, then there is a cohesive structure to um, paragraph 5.2 of the schedule, which is adverse possession and proprietary uh, estoppel are two cumulative requir requirements to bring yourself within yes. it. And you may have cases of proprietary estoppel, which uh, are are cases of adverse possession because standing by or acquiescence may not involve consent. Yes. So far, so good. If, on the other hand, what prevents one being able to bring oneself within the adverse possession criterion is that you're occupying under an equitable right, then surely all people who have a proprietary estoppel are claiming an equitable right, and there would be no content left for paragraph 5.2 at all. Well, 
uh, I, I would suggest that um, there is a very fine line as to, and, and where that line uh, lies as to what is consent and what is mere uh, acquiescence um, uh, uh, that would give rise to a, uh, an estoppel. Um, it is difficult to discern. And in fact, I think that the textbooks, if I can just find the example uh, in uh, one of the textbooks where they, where they um, set out the very limited circumstances where this particular condition may actually be deployed. Um, we cite it in our skeleton argument. Is that real from Roper? I believe so. Um, no, it's just a moment. result may be to limit the condition to cases where the proprietor passively acquiesced in the squatter being in possession of the land. Yes, and so, so that, that is what I say. That, that is what I say about the limitations of this uh, particular um, paragraph. I understand that. Yes. That at least gives content to paragraph 5.2, albeit content in a relatively narrow category of, of case. What I was putting to you is that if the test is that it's not adverse possession if someone is occupying under an equitable right, there can be no content at all to paragraph 5.2 because someone claiming an equitable estoppel is always claiming an equitable right. Well, what I, what I uh, hope I have done in my submissions is to, um, to delimit um, the, the parameters of, of that particular, um, uh, the operation of that particular paragraph because um, uh, when I say equitable right, uh, um, in the context that I was making my submissions, that was about informal sales of land, and that, that was the equitable right that I'm, I was referring to. Yes. Um, but as Roa from Roper um, clearly states, that there, there are um, limited circumstances where you may have an equity um, where um, it relies on acquiescence, for example, um, that would fall into this paragraph. And it's those very limited circumstances where you have an equitable right and you do come within the paragraph, um, but they are not the circumstances I was referring to earlier in my submissions about informal sales of land, such right. as the bridges. So, 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 so your formulation is um, no adverse possession where you have consent. You're not contending that there can never be adverse possession where you're occupying under an equitable right. Well, that can't be correct because, um, right. uh, of course, the, the, the provision would have no teeth whatsoever. Um, I'm not going that far, and in fact, that's not the, ca the facts of this case. The facts of this case are clearly that there was an express, uh, or allegedly an express promise that they could have the land, um, and that is, uh, in my submission, uh, a, a, um, a promise, uh, an express promise, uh, allegedly, um, that they can go into occupation and, and that it will be there, so they are allowed in with consent, there's express no consent. acquiescence. My friend did try to characterise um, Mrs. Healy's um, inaction uh, as one of acquiescence in the course of his submissions. But uh, I would respectfully suggest there's nothing of that nature in the facts that are pleaded. This is not an acquiescence case because it's positively pleaded that her agent or those acting on her behalf. There, there told was a suggestion by Mr. Lewis that there might have a fallback case if Mr. Maloney turned out not to be her agent or not to have authority. But, but as the judge pointed out, that, that's not been articulated yes. at this stage. Yes, as as uh, is the characteristic um, of of most of uh, the pleading, it is contradictory, um, and and the pleading and their their submissions. Mr. Lewis making that point to the judge uh, that contradicts the clear words that are used in the pleading. Um, so, so on your case, on your on your submissions as to the law, the facts pleaded in paragraph six. Make it a case where adverse possession is not available as a matter of law. Yeah, that, that's your. That's and I think you put it in two alternative ways. One is because those facts show that the possession uh, was with consent. Yes. And secondly, and alternatively, uh, it's also said that it was under a license. Licence is something narrower than consent, then that's plainly inconsistent with adverse possession. Yes. I think that's what you were submitting when you were saying when you consider this 
feeding is even more nuanced. Yes. It's not limited to just with permission. It, it, it's it, also it, an express averment of licensee. Have I understood the two different ways you put it? Well, yes. Uh, uh, so I'm grappling with the inconsistencies in the pleading. On the one hand, they're told you can go into possession uh, and um, the, the property is, sorry, let me be more precise, uh, the property is yours. That, that's, that's the thrust of what's being uh, averred in the, uh, in the pleading. And then um, there is the suggestion throughout the pleading as well that they are licensees. Well, a license is a more precarious right by its very nature than an equitable right that is generated by someone promising you the property. What, what is being alleged is that you are the owner of the property um, by the exchange that was alleged to have occurred. Um, that is not the same thing as, as, a, as a mere license, which is a temporary permission to do something that would otherwise be unlawful, that would otherwise be a trespass. Yes, it, I mean, it, it's not... It's something different from what is pleaded in paragraph six as the factual position, but as a, as a characterization, as a legal characterization or a legal averment, you, you say what was being averted was a license which is an averment of some temporary status or revocable status. Yes, um, but, but crucially, both of them. And, and, and that, on any view, that can't be um, an adverse possession. Or, or on any view, the law as it stands, um, uh, as it would apply to Section 15 of the Limitation Act, requires that there is an absence of consent, that the possession is adverse to the paper title owner. Um, and both of the characterizations of the appellant's case, uh, on whichever it is, whether it's through the um, proprietary estoppel or, or, or other type of equity, um, or whether it's through the license, amounts to a consent to occupy the land. All right, thank you. My Lord, have I addressed both of those questions to your satisfaction? Yes, so far as I'm concerned. Yes, I think so. Thank you very much. My Lord's. Any reply on that, uh, Mr. Brown? Thank you, my Lord. Can I just take up the first point, the last point first, which is that my learned friend seeks to characterise paragraphs six through to eight as involving two separate cases which are being run in parallel. Um, I respectfully suggest that that is an, a um, mischaracterization of paragraph six through to eight of the draft amended pleading. <coughs> the, I've said it before and I say it again. Paragraph eight plainly seeks to draw out what has been said at paragraph six and seven. It doesn't seek to put forward some separate case that in the alternative to Messrs Maloney and Quinn having said, it's all yours, Oh, uh oh, they might have given me, a, as my learned friend put it himself, a temporary permission. I mean, we've got to live in the land of, the re of reality in my respectful submission. And that is not what is being, being said by paragraph eight. And I'm saying it's not being said by paragraph eight. And I'm, the, I I'm counsel for the, for the, um, for the appellant who, who proffers this, this, this amendment um, for, 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 for consent and, see and seeks permission for it, rather. So. It's just not the case that there's an internal contradiction between paragraphs six, seven, and eight. I accept the word license is used in a loose sense, but I'm clarifying that so far as it needs to be clarified. And I don't think it does need to be clarified because it's perfectly obvious. It's not seeking to put forward some separate freestanding and alternative proposition to paragraph six and seven. And it's just a characterization of it's yours, you can have it. Well, it, it may it may be that the language could have been used in a slightly more um, a, a slightly clearer way, but 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 courts of law, yeah, you know, there there are many things, but they're not courts of um uh, of, of proper English usage. Um, um, oh, let's try to. Use I, I, my lord, if, I, I'm certainly not suggesting that the the, the the judgments that flow are not paragons of the English language. I, I, I'm certainly not suggesting that, but I'm. Uh, I'm suggesting what your lordship said. I don't think I need to take the matter any any further. And my only friend then says, the suggestion that is made throughout the pleading is that we are licensees. The word licensee is used once. It's used only only in paragraph eight. It's not some sort of pervasive secondary or alternative plea. I do invite the court to consider the pleading in a in a 
common sense and realist, in a realistic way. Well, that was the point I was going to make on that. Now, my learned, my learned <coughs> friend has made some very far-reaching submissions. Um, and no doubt he's bound to have to make some, some, some such far-reaching submissions in order to make good his position on this, on this appeal. The, my learned friend, Mr. Hackett, was, while my learned friend was making his submissions, looked at the position of Bridges and Mies, Bridges and Mies, as, Mies uh, on Westlaw, and, and it's been cited many times since it was decided in 1957. Uh, and I think without wishing to, I, I can't go through every single citation, it, it would be inappropriate to do so, but it's, I think the, 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 broad, the broad thrust is it's been cited with, with, with approving, approvingly, and of course, uh, any, any, any words that fall from the, from the lips of Lord, of, of Mr. Justice Harmon, subsequently Lord Justice Harmon, are to be treated, I respectfully suggest, with the utmost respect. And indeed, when one comes to look at the fate or the consideration by the, the learned editors of McGarry and Wade of um, Bridges and Meats, one can, one can find it at page 289 of the Internal Pagination of the Lordship's Authorities, tab 19. And one, one sees at paragraph 7.054 a, a consideration of the relevant question. A statement of the relevant law drawing on what was said by Mr. Justice Harmon as he then was. One knows the authority of McGarry and Wade and the learning of the editors of that work. Does one see any registration of dissent? No, one does not. My lord, one further goes to, my learned friend then says that the example given by the Law Commission, the second example, was wrong, and he has to say that, and it's a bold submission. He, he suggests that he's fortified by Mr. Jordan's book. One turns to Mr. Jordan's book, uh, and in particular, one turns to, uh, if I may um, request that the court turns to page 241 of the Authorities Bundle, tab 16. We've looked at this already, but I'm bound to return to it because one sees there Mr. Jordan and Mr. Radley Gardner <coughs> citing the final report. Paras 2, 2, 22, para 70, uh, sub para 76, without a hint of a dissent from the propriety and accuracy of those two examples. And one, we haven't got the learning before the court on the question of the status of law commission reports, and I, I, I believe there is extensive learning on on the status of bills and law commission reports, uh, where, where the Act has been passed um, by reference to the bill promoted by the Commission. But what we know here is the Act was passed by reference to the bill promote, promoted by the Commission, and which was the subject of a, a learned, a, a detailed disquisition on its meaning terms and terms. And it would be a very strange and dangerous thing, in my respectful submission. For this court to now say, well, the act was passed on the basis of a, of a report which was premised on understandings A, B, and C. We think, the, we think those understandings, or at least some of them, are wrong. And therefore, we're going to interpret the act in a way which differs from the interpretation accorded to it and intended by it, uh, by, the, by the commission. That would be a, a very dangerous thing to do in my respectful, uh, in my respectful submission. I mean, the, actually, both parties quite radical submissions in this case, don't they? Because your submission is that Parliament has changed the meaning of adverse possession from what it has always been in, in the case of registered land, although without actually spelling that out, um, whereas uh, Mr Walsh's submission is that the Law Commission gave an example which is wrong. Uh, I... I... I have, the, I have the advantage, I would respectfully suggest, my lord, that I have the Law Commission saying, this is what, how we understand the law will act in this situation. And we've drafted a bill which is designed to embrace that. And 
Parliament, without picking up on this point and rejecting it, has duly passed the bill as, 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 as proposed. So the radicalism, if there is any, I, I suggest is made rather more on my learned friend's side of the court than, than mine. And really, really, the, the, the nub question, the key, the key proposition that I respectfully advanced to this court earlier this afternoon was to say that essentially the proposition of my learned friend is to, is to render, is to create a fundamental contradiction between paragraph one and paragraph five of schedule six. And such as to really require the, this court to read down in a way entirely unwarranted by the language, to read down paragraph five, uh, uh, subparagraph two. We've not actually looked at it. And let's just briefly, before I sit down, please. Have a have a brief look at look at that. The, it, it, it's it's um tab five, page seventeen. I'm so sorry, sixteen of the bundle. The first condition is at five two. It would be unconscionable because of an equity by estoppel for the registered proprietor to seek to dis dispossess the applicant and then and then B and so on. Now, what we know is that those words, an equity by estoppel, were intended by the Law Commission to, con to, to bring in to paragraph 5 the law of proprietary estoppel in all its manifestations. And we see that very clearly from the passages of the Law Commission report that I showed to your lordships. Now, my learned friend is driven to having to effectively denude those words of much of their content. And one asks, where is his authority for doing so? Well, he would say it's in what is in fact the first condition, which you get in paragraph one, not in paragraph five, because all of this only applies uh, to a person who can apply to the registrar as having been in the first position. That, that can't work. That cannot work for this reason. That it, it, the notion that the law, that, the, that, that Schedule 6 was being promoted by, was being set forth and, and enacted by Parliament in a way that, that Provision 1, both of them have to, be, have to be jumped through in order to make good the application for registration. But what one has to posit there is that Parliament has, in promoting <coughs> or requiring condition one, which is, or, or precondition one, which is the paragraph one, has, has sowed the seeds of the, of, the, of the destruction and denudement of condition two. My Lord leads to, I said to say, remarkable, remarkable consequences, which cannot have been, cannot have been intended. My Lord, Ash, I don't think I need to say anything more about Ashworth and Stroud. The, the, the Lordships obviously have, the, have read it carefully. I'm grateful. I'm grateful for that. And my learned friend was driven to say that was wrongly decided as well. And finally, I just I, my learned friend's referred to a case called Hyde and Pierce, which is in your Lordship's bundle of authorities. And and it doesn't it doesn't refer to Bridges and Mees and Mees. And on analysis says nothing contradictory of Bridges and Mees, because in Hyde and Pierce, there were two key facts missing from Bridges and Meese, not just missing, but differentiating in a substantial way. The first is that the purchase price had not been paid in full. And the second thing is that the, the, the purchaser or the proto-purchaser entered into, by reference to certain terms and conditions, where so long as he hadn't paid the purchase price, he was a contractual licensee. My Lord, I don't think I need to, I, I, I think, those are all my submissions, unless I can assist you further. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, well, we're going to reserve our judgment in this case. The uh, draft judgment will be circulated in due course to those whose names have been given. Uh, we would hope that, in the light of them, you will be able to agree uh, the terms of an order for us to approve. Uh, if you find that you can't, we will have short submissions in writing and on them without a
further hearing. Uh, as I expect you know, but I will say it anyway, uh, the draft judgment is subject to an embargo, which will make clear the limited purposes for which it can be used, and the court takes that embargo very seriously. Thank you both. Thank you all very much for your assistance in this. Thank you, Alex.